Hi, this is Paul Erlinson. I'm the Director of Product Support for Lynx Studio Technology. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the new Lynx mixer for the AES-16e and Aurora Thunderbolt product. The mixer has the same feature set for both the AES-16e and Aurora, but the labeling's a little bit different. It's installed automatically with driver build 20 and above for Windows or driver 56 or above for OS X. On both platforms, the mixer is essentially identical except for a couple minor differences. The new Lynx mixer is the most streamlined and easy to use tool yet for harnessing the depth and power of Lynx hardware. It is quite different from the previous versions of the Lynx mixer, so if you have upgraded from an older driver, it may take a little time to get the hang of it. Watching this video from beginning to end can speed up your learning curve considerably. The mixer consists of four panes and a number of menu items. The menus are covered in detail in the LTTB Owner's Manual, which is on the Link Studio Technology website. The menus are where mixer scenes can be saved and recalled, where driver and firmware versions can be revealed, and where advanced parameters can be set. In a multi-unit configuration, either multiple daisy-chained Aurora TBs or multiple AES-16E cards, the adapter settings page is where the order of devices can be established. This is a very handy capability, as some modern operating systems can jumble device order. The Lynx device IDs are programmed into the hardware when selected, so it is a very secure method of assuring that the devices appear in the desired order every time the system is powered up. Even if they are moved to a different computer, the device order will remain intact unless changed again from the adapter settings menu. This is also where the channel mode for each device can be set. 16 channel mode is the default, which covers the onboard digital channels on the AES-16E and the analog I.O. channels on an Aurora 16. With an AES-16E, choosing 24 channel or 32 channel mode would generally be desirable if an LS8 at expansion card was used or with the AS50 version of the card. With an Aurora 16, 24 or 32 channel mode would be selected if 8 or 16 channels of the onboard AES digital I.O. were going to be used. The navigation bar of the Lynx mixer provides access to mixer scene open or save, sample rate select, or sync source. It is also where you can hide or unhide mixer panels. Of the four mixer panels, the only one that cannot be hidden is the outputs panel. Understanding the outputs panel is key to understanding the Lynx mixer. This is where you control the level of each of the outputs and also manage routing. The faders are grouped into stereo pairs, but you can ungroup them to adjust individual channels if you wish. Outputs can also be muted here, both channels when grouped, individual channels when not. Above the meters, a numeric display indicates the amount of attenuation in dB that has been performed on the associated output. The channel labels under the mute buttons are also used to control routing. The new Lynx mixer is basically output driven in regards to routing. This means that first you select an output, then you can select which sources are patched to that output. We'll look into the details of how this works later. The first panel that can be hidden or revealed is the adapter panel. This is where clock settings are established and digital status information is available. The current clock source and sample rate are visible at the top. The rate lock function is only pertinent for internal clocking. When active, this function freezes the unit at the current sample rate. If an audio app requests a different sample rate, the unit will not switch. Rate lock is off by default, and for the overwhelming majority of users, that is the best setting. Rate lock is most commonly used by broadcasters, who stream audio sources at a variety of sample rates but need a constant sample rate reference for downstream devices. When rate lock is on, the operating system will often resample the audio stream to match the established rate. The SyncroLock button is for the Lynx proprietary clocking system. It is dual function, showing the lock status when SyncroLock is engaged, or SyncroLock can be disabled by clicking the button. The preferred clock source section is where all available clock sources are displayed and can be selected. 
With an AS16E card, clock sources that have a valid signal available will display the sample rate being generated by that source. If no valid clock signal is available, not present will be displayed instead. If a clock source is selected that does not have a valid clock signal present, then the current clock source will remain internal until the preferred clock source has been reestablished. With an Aurora TB, below the preferred clock source section are the analog input and output trims. These can be toggled between plus 4 and negative 10 in banks of 4. Please note, an Aurora 16 VT will not have these trim options available, since with that model the trims are set by POTS on the mainboard. The next panel that can be hit away is the record panel. This is where the device's inputs can be managed. The Lynx approach to inputs is quite unique and worth examining more closely. Most audio interfaces have physical inputs, like analog in one, hardwired to a software record device that you select in your recording program. When you choose N1, you will be able to record and monitor signals from analog input 1. End of story. The Lynx drivers allow more flexibility here. We have between 16 and 32 record devices that are defaulted in a logical order, but can be changed by the user. Why would that matter? Let's say you are using an Aurora 16, but want the digital inputs to show up first in your software, not the analog inputs. Simple. Set record 1 plus 2 to digital in 1 left and right, and you're set. Or, let's say you have an input signal that you want sent to two separate software apps at the same time, maybe one for recording and another for processing. You can assign the same physical inputs to two or more record inputs to achieve this. The rest of the settings in this section involve monitoring inputs through a unit's outputs. This is a capability of Lynx's powerful hardware monitoring features. With hardware monitoring, the user can take sources, either input streams or playback streams, and patch them through to the unit's outputs. The benefit of hardware monitoring is that the performer does not have to contend with any audible latency, no matter how large the project they're recording into. Assigning an input to be heard through an output is a matter of selecting the output you are listening to then unmuting the input that one wishes to hear through that output. Let's say, for example, that we have a bass performance coming in input number 3, and we wish to monitor it through stereo output 1 and 2. Simply select the output first, then unmute input 3. Voila! As you can see, the input signal is now passing to the desired output. Since the source is mono, we probably want to pan the signal to the center of the stereo field. Easily done, as each input has a pan control. Keep in mind that this control manipulates the input signal being monitored through the selected output, but has no bearing on the signal being recorded in your DAW. Your DAW, in this example, would still be set to input 3. Let's say you are recording a band and have 16 sources to monitor through one stereo output. No problem, there is no limit to how many inputs can be assigned to an output. Do keep in mind, though, that with multiple input sources being monitored through a single output, the combined levels can overload the outputs. The faders in the record section are specifically for this purpose. Please note, these faders do not control the record levels. Lynx hardware generally allows no alteration of input level because we are sonic purists. If your signal is coming in too hot for the recording software and clipping the input, you need to manage that from the source being recorded. The faders here are to attenuate the amount of signal being monitored through the corresponding output. A numeric display above the fader reveals the amount of attenuation performed. As with the outputs, pan pots, faders, and mutes are grouped for channel pairs. You can ungroup them to pan, mute, or attenuate individual channels. Keep in mind, too, that these settings are output specific. As we flip through different outputs, Completely different inputs can be assigned along with different levels, pan positions, group states, mutes, etc. The final mixer panel to look at is the play panel. This section is where playback streams from software are routed and monitored. 
Unlike the record page, where no signals are routed to outputs by default, the play panel has play streams pre-assigned to corresponding outputs. For instance, play 1 and 2 is routed to the first pair of outputs, play 3 and 4 to the second pair, etc. This is the ideal configuration for most users. There are a few cases where it may be advantageous to route and control these play streams independently. For one case, let's say you are working on a mix and would like to send the same play stream to output 1 and 2 for the engineer and output 3 and 4 for the artist. We will presume that the play stream is coming from play 1 and 2 in this example. Since play 1 and 2 is already pre-assigned to output 1 and 2, that can be left alone. Now we just need to unmute play 1 and 2 with output 3 and 4 selected in the outputs panel. What we'll see is that the Play 1 and 2 stream is going to output 1 and 2 and output 3 and 4 simultaneously. As with input monitoring, pan and level controls can be set individually for each source to output connection. Let's look at a scenario that combines input monitoring and play source routing. Imagine that you are recording an artist who is overdubbing into an existing session. We want to be able to fine tune the mix elements for the artist so they give an optimal performance. To do so, we can assign mix elements to different play streams. For instance, drums go to play 1 and 2, bass to play 3 and 4, guitars to play 5 and 6, and keys to play 7 and 8. The artist is playing through a preamp plugged into input 1. Now let's say that we want these same elements going to the recording engineer. The artist is listening to a headphone amp through outputs 1 and 2, the engineer is listening through outputs 3 and 4. To set this up, we start by clicking on Out 1 and 2 in the Outputs pane. Then we unmute the four pairs of playback stems, drums on 1 and 2, bass on 3 and 4, guitars on 5 and 6, keys on 7 and 8. Now on the Record pane, we unmute Input 1 and pan it to the center. We do the same arrangement to Outputs 3 and 4, all the play streams and the input. The engineer wants an overall lower level more of the performer, less drums. The performer wants more guitar, more keys, and less bass. Oh, and could you pan his performance towards the left? Done. If this is a setup that will be recurring, we can save this as a scene for easy recall. As you can see, the new Lynx Mixer provides for tremendous flexibility with minimal fuss and bother. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.